Hello there. Nerd! On today's episode of NPC Backstories, let me tell you the tale of the Red Archer. Peter Larkins was a humble villager from the town of Harrenholm. He lived on the outskirts of the city as a farmer. He had no real skills or talents to speak of, and his life was rather uneventful, working day in and day out to support himself and his only child, Victoria. The only break in the monotony of his life was when he went into town to go to church. Harrenholm was a beautiful city, and it was considered to be the divine capital of the world. But if Peter was honest with himself, he didn't really care about the gods. After all, it didn't seem that they cared about him. His life was nothing special. But going into town did make his daughter, Victoria, smile. She dreamed of one day living in that city. And so Peter resolved to make that dream come true one day. But the gods were not kind. Peter's farm experienced famine. The crop, the livestock, and his daughter all began to wither away. And so Peter went to the church, looking for help. He pleaded with cleric and god alike to no avail. He wasn't able to afford their services. Victoria's condition continued to worsen until she could hardly breathe. As Peter stayed by her bedside, his heart slowly breaking, he realized he would do anything to save his daughter's life. And that was when he heard a gentle knock at the door. Waiting outside was a woman with curled horns and skin like fire a devil who introduced herself as the Collector. Peter had only heard of such creatures, never actually believing them to be real. He opened his mouth, but no words came. The devil slowly smiled and put a finger to Peter's lips. She then proposed a deal, a life for a life. The devil had a problem that could only be solved by a mortal. The issue was that Harrenholm, the holy city, was so sacred no fiend could enter, but she needed to collect on a deal. A merchant owed her and refused to pay up. He thought he was safe in Harrenholm. She wanted to prove him wrong. Hours go by. Later that night, the merchant woke up, feeling cold. He felt a breeze. He turned over in his bed to see if he left the window open and saw the silhouette of a man climbing through the frame. He froze for just a second and then took a deep breath, preparing to scream. But that second was all the time Peter needed. Without hesitation, without thought, Peter lunged at the merchant. His hand reached out, bound something heavy, and bashed it against the merchant's head. The next thing the merchant knew, he was outside the city walls, kneeling before his old business partner. The merchant began to plead, beg for his life, asking for another deal. But the devil just smiled and then nodded to Peter. Without ceremony, Peter took out his knife and slit the merchant's throat. Peter had never been a violent man, certainly not a murderer. But as he watched that man die at his feet and his soul be harvested by a devil, he felt no remorse. His only thoughts were of his daughter. The devil upheld her end of the bargain, and Peter's daughter recovered quickly. But Peter's problems were still not over. His farm continued to flounder, and Peter watched every day as his daughter became more resigned to living a life of squalor. And that made Peter think back to that bloody night with a certain fondness. Not because he committed murder, but because his issues had been solved so easily, so quickly. And as Peter lay in bed reminiscing, he heard another <laughs> knock at the door. It seemed the collector had yet another offer, one that was mutually beneficial. Peter wanted to give his daughter the life she always wanted, living in the city, and the collector needed someone in that city to report to her. Remember, Heron Home was too sacred for fiends to enter, but Peter was already a known member of the church. The contract was simple. All Peter had to do was gather and report information. And in return, the devil guaranteed a comfortable life for him and his daughter. The deal sounded too good to refuse. After all, Peter was just a commoner. 
what information of use or value could he possibly gain? So he readily agreed. The devil left with the signed contract in hand. But before she departed, she told Peter that he should expect his fortunes to have changed by the next morning. And that next morning, a letter arrived. Peter had to reread it several times because he couldn't believe his eyes. The letter detailed how Peter had just inherited a lord's estate and title. Included in the letter was a scroll of pedigree explaining how Peter was a descendant of a noble bastard's child from generations ago. The main branch of the family had just recently died, leaving behind no other inheritor. Before Peter knew what happened, his entire life changed. And while many of the upper class viewed Peter with suspicion, he did make some new friends, especially in the church, because after all, he had been such a long-standing member of the community. They were happy for him. And, by the way, if he had some extra money, the church was looking for donations. Donations that his devilish business partner urged him to give. As time went by, Peter's life began to revolve almost entirely around the church, leaving little time to spend with his daughter. But everything he was doing was for Victoria, so it was all right. His days would be spent within the confines of hollow halls, and at night he'd socialize with the clergy at the local tavern. He became regarded as a close confidant, a friend, especially to Father Mathen. And then, one night, when Mathen had too much to drink, he let Peter in on a little secret. Among the church's members was a group called the Inquisitors, people devoted to leaving the safety of Harrenholm and wiping out the devilish threat that lay outside its walls. Upon hearing this information, the devil feigned surprise, but Peter wasn't fooled. She then urged him to go ingratiate himself further, even perhaps go on an expedition with the Inquisitors, get a first-hand account of what they do. Peter wasn't a fool. He knew where this was going. But, to be honest, he didn't care. Now, of course, Peter wouldn't be allowed to just join the Inquisitors on one of their secret missions. But Father Mathen did let slip where one of these missions was taking place. And so Peter arranged to have business there. When Peter arrived in town, he immediately began to track down the Inquisitors, which he eventually managed to do. But the Inquisitors noticed. Peter was not trained in the art of stealth. Just as the Inquisitors were about to confront Peter, Devils descended upon the village en masse. The Inquisitors were soon overwhelmed. And in the chaos, one of these devils took Peter aside, gave him a weapon, and told him that it was now his duty to rescue the Inquisitors. Slightly flustered but obedient, Peter marched into battle, swinging his new blade. The devilish horde began to falter, breaking before his onslaught. And seeing this, the Inquisitors were able to rally and push back the attackers. The devils then vanished as quickly as they came, and Peter found himself being hailed as a hero. Later that night, as they celebrated, one of the Inquisitors jokingly said that Peter should join their ranks, and Peter readily accepted. There was an awkward pause, and the Inquisitors excused themselves to go discuss the matter privately. Peter waited anxiously for about an hour, alone, wondering if he had made the right decision, if he had said the right thing. But then the Inquisitors returned and told Peter that he would be accepted as an initiate. To become a full member, he would have to pass the training regimen. And so it was that when Peter returned to Harrenholm, the training began. It was a grueling process, and truly, Peter didn't show much promise. He had some skill with the bow, since he used to hunt in the nearby woods back when he lived on the outskirts of town. But otherwise, he came across as clumsy when compared to his peers. Yet Peter couldn't give up. His livelihood depended upon his success. So he spent every waking moment training, not for himself, but for his daughter, a daughter that Peter could now barely recognize. He had been so busy these past years, he missed her grow into a beautiful young woman. As Peter spent his time infiltrating the inner workings of the church, Victoria was doing what she could to make her father proud. She was the epitome of the perfect lady. She attended galas and was quick with making connections to other noble families. And, of course, she attended church fervently. She didn't know her father's true feelings about the church. She just knew that he spent all of his time there. And so, she began to as well, in a vain attempt to grow closer to Peter. 
it was almost unavoidable that Victoria would gain the attention of someone like Lord Darwin. Lord Darwin was a young gentleman who came from a family with deep connections to both Harrenholm and the church. In fact, his younger brother Edgar was also an initiate, training to be an inquisitor alongside Peter. And it was around the same time that Peter finished his training and was fully accepted into the Inquisition that Lord Darwin asked for Victoria's hand in marriage. The irony of the situation was not lost on Peter. His daughter would now be bound to the same church that he was undermining. And yet, how could he say no to his daughter now? Years go by. Victoria is now happily married, and a child is on the way. Peter has gained quite the reputation as a soldier of the faith. Despite the odds, he always returns home safely, which is quite the accomplishment considering how recently the casualty rate has risen steeply. I think we all know why. Additionally, something became quite apparent in these past few years. I said before that Peter had no true skills or talents to speak of. But Peter did have one trait that separated him from his peers, his dogged determination. Those hours he spent training, and continued to spend training, had made him the best archer in all of Harrenholm. And after seeing how determined Peter was to be of service to the faith, it only made sense for the Inquisitors to offer him a role of leadership. Peter was given his own company to command, and one of those men he commanded was his son-in-law's brother, the young Lord Edgar. And then it happened. Maybe it was inevitable, or perhaps Peter had just become too relaxed. Either way, he made a mistake. Peter and his men were in a small village, investigating the report of cult worship. This was standard protocol, nothing that exciting. Peter stepped away from his camp and went into the nearby woods. Peter then summoned the collector, as he had done countless times before, to give a routine update. But this time, the devil interrupted his report by placing a finger on her lips and then pointing to a nearby bush. Peter turned to investigate and watched the young Lord Edgar leap out of the bush and start sprinting back to camp. It was just unfortunate timing, a coincidence, that Lord Edgar had been sent to go find Peter at that very moment. When he saw what Peter was doing, he thought it best to stay silent and eavesdrop. And now, after being discovered, all Edgar knew was that he had to go tell the others. He had to, very quickly. Peter hesitated. He turned towards the devil, and she just gave Peter a smile, the same sickly smile that she gave the night that Peter made his first kill. Peter spun back around, took aim with his bow, and let an arrow fly. The arrow hit its mark, but that moment of hesitation made all the difference. With his last ounce of strength, Edgar clawed his way back to camp, and with his dying breath condemned Peter. By the time Peter arrived, all of his men were armed and ready for him. For Peter, all hope was lost. But then, a horde of devils surrounded the camp. They made quick work of the Inquisitors. But they did not kill them. The men were left disarmed, incapacitated. The collector then appeared, as if from the shadows by Peter's side, and told him, quite simply, that this was his mess. He had to finish the job. These were men he knew, men he trusted, men that had trusted him. But this was the only way he could survive, and with every killing blow, he cursed the fact that he had hesitated. If only he had been quicker, he could have stopped Edgar from reaching the camp and saved these men from this fate. And so, Peter vowed to never hesitate again. Yet, the day was still not over for Peter. Him being the only survivor of the company would be highly suspicious, especially considering how this was such a routine mission. And so, a new deal was struck. The devils would take care of everything and guarantee the safety of Peter and his family evermore. All Peter had to do was obey what they said. He would no longer be just an informant. He would be an instrument. Peter agreed. As far as he was concerned, his soul was damned already. As long as his daughter and soon-to-be grandchild were safe, what did it matter what he did? The devils then swarmed the village, massacring the inhabitants and turning it into a scar upon the earth. Peter was found days later among the wreckage, 
seemingly on the brink of death. The people of Harrenholm viewed his survival as a godsend. Well, not all of them. It didn't sit right with Lord Darwin that Peter somehow kept narrowly escaping death. Why was he so lucky? As Peter's son-in-law, Darwin knew Peter. He knew that there was nothing special about him. Sure, he was a good archer now. But why would he be chosen by the divine, especially over someone like his younger brother? Edgar had been a pure soul, someone worth saving. Peter was a dour old man. And so Lord Darwin began to look into Peter's affairs, and he noticed inconsistencies. With each inconsistency, Lord Darwin's obsession grew. He knew he was on to something. He knew his brother should have survived that day. He began funneling all of his family's wealth into discovering the truth. He started to lose sleep. He became manic, obsessed. He started to scare Victoria. And so it was that when Lord Darwin was a hair's breadth away to uncovering the truth, Victoria went to her father and told him her concerns. Peter realized he had to stop Darwin. This time, not for his daughter's or grandchild's safety, but for his own. Peter decided it was time for a father-son-in-law chat. When Darwin returned home that night, Peter was waiting for him in his study. It immediately became clear to Peter that there was no chance for a compromise here, but he had come prepared. As Darwin glared at his father-in-law, Peter pulled out an infernal artifact from Darwin's desk and then coolly snapped his fingers. Inquisitors piled into the room and began restraining Darwin. That night, Darwin was imprisoned for possession of illegal contraband and suspicion of cavorting with devils. But Darwin was steadfast in his beliefs and would not be silenced. Despite being in prison, despite being tortured, Darwin proclaimed his innocence while simultaneously condemning Peter. But Peter made sure that those accusations didn't go far. Darwin was sentenced to death for his crimes against the church. And when Victoria heard the news, she was understandably heartbroken. She blamed herself for going to her father, and in her despair, she became bedridden and refused to eat. Victoria's health continued to deteriorate, and Peter knew that the devils couldn't interfere as long as Victoria stayed in Harrenholm. So he sent her back to the family farm. Here the devils could do their magic. But even so, Victoria had no will to live. The collector thought of a solution. She could alter Victoria's memories. Peter agreed to this proposal and told the devil that while she was at it, he should be forgotten as well. Peter believed he would only continue causing his daughter and grandchild sorrow. It would be better for them if they didn't know he existed. From that day on, Victoria and her child lived a peaceful life on the farm. She had fond memories of her husband, but couldn't quite remember what he looked like. She knew that he had died on the farm a few years ago from an accident but he had left behind some money and that she and her child were well provided for. Oftentimes at night, Victoria would feel a great pang of loneliness, sadness, guilt, but she still wanted to live, if for nothing more than her child. And now, with Victoria and his grandchild out of the picture, Peter became a man without distraction. Over the next few years, he engrossed himself in his work, steadily rising through the ranks. The entire time, the devils made sure that Peter succeeded where others failed. The devils kept losing battle after battle, but they knew that they were winning the war. It should be no surprise that Peter was eventually made High Inquisitor and a member of the king's private council. And this is where you will find him today, in your own story. Please, incorporate Peter into your campaign. Use him as you see fit, and maybe you and your players can find your own ending to this story. If you like this story and want more like it, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. You know, all that jazz. And also, please be patient. It takes me a while. I'm very slow at this. <laughs> Bye, everybody!